may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I lift my eyes, I lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in me. Hello, good morning, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Chloe. And I'm Nathan. Welcome everyone and welcome to those joining in online as well. Now, I don't know about you guys, but since the clocks went forward and it was officially spring, I feel like all of my neighbours are like sorting their lives out. You know, spring cleans, you can see bags going out to the tip, people like cleaning their cars and their gutters and jet washing their patios. Is that just me? Has anyone else noticed that? Nathan, have you done any like spring cleaning in the house? In the house, uh, I've, been, I've been camping myself in the house because of the weather. Uh, I've put up a few shelves, if that nice. counts. I've painted a couple of rooms. Uh, Christy's been the grafter. So Christy planted last weekend 15 plants 15. in the garden. Wow. So, yeah, a lot of I'm getting to work. Yeah, how about you, Chloe? I haven't done anything. I mean, I've done a little clean, maybe not a spring clean. I intend to watch Russo Jet Wash up that at some point. <laughs> uh, how about you guys? Have a little chat next to your kids. Have you had to, like, clean your rooms? Has anyone done a little, like, spring clean? Have a little chat to the person next to you. Great. Well, by the chatter, it sounds like you've all been very busy. Um, my next project is another shelf. <laughs> 
But this one's a bit more special. So what I have here is a piece of English oak, controversially. Um, but this is special. This was given to me uh, by my father-in-law. And before I can just like whack this up on the wall, uh, this will need to be like sanded down, uh, cut to shape. It'll need to be treated so it can withstand like scrapes. It's a very small from... shelf, Nate. I don't know but what you're you going to put on it. <laughs> I think, do you know what it is? I think it's for the, we'll have to consult Christy, it's for the bathroom for like candles, is it? Can candle shelf. <laughs> yeah. You know you're married when so. you're putting up a candle yeah. shelf. <laughs> I, just, I just get texted some instructions. That's what it is. <laughs> Um, but no, all these kind of DIY jobs that we've been getting up to, um, I say now that the weather's getting better, I believe it. Um, it made me think of the kind of, the, the, the way that God is described in the Bible uh, as well. And we have a verse um, that I'm reminded of when we think about these things from Isaiah. It says, we are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. And if you think about clay, this is something that needs to be shaped, strengthened, and cared for when it's made. And for us, when we invite God into our lives, he shapes and strengthens and cares for us. Like even though we're works in progress, even though we might feel like lumps of clay at times, he's always strengthening, always caring, and always shaping us when we invite him in. So before we go into worship, why don't we stand and I'll just pray that encouragement for us this morning. Father, thank you that you are always shaping us. Thank you that you are always strengthening us and you are always caring for us. And God, I ask that when we you know, invite you in to, to do that, would we be encouraged by that? and turn that encouragement now to praise. Amen. Amen. Great, well, we're going to go into a time of worship now, so over to Beth and the band. Great, well, thanks, guys. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be together to worship this morning, and good morning if you're watching online. We're going to sing a few songs together now, just uh, declaring God's promises over our lives. Um, so, yeah, please join in with us. The words will be up on the screen.
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you.
Jesus himself references this in his teachings. He says, when we build our lives on the rock, build our lives on who he is, the truth about who God is, that we will not be shaken. But the storms of life will come. But they won't weather us. We will be able to stand through it because of who Jesus is and who our lives are built on. So as we sing this next part, let's just declare that over ourselves. No matter what we're going through, that God is our rock. Jesus is the firm foundation. We can find strength and safety and protection in his presence this morning.
one of our students, their family at home have bees and they make their own honey. And now and again, he brings Russo and I a little pot of fresh honey. And it's delicious and it's so sweet and I enjoy having it on my porridge every morning. And in the Proverbs, it says this, My child, eat honey, for it is good, and the honeycomb is sweet to the taste. In the same way, wisdom is sweet to your soul. If you find it, you'll have a bright future, and your hopes will not be cut short. And I felt this morning, if anyone feels that they just need wisdom for a particular situation in their life right now, whether something at work or something with a family, but you need like God's supernatural wisdom in a situation that he wants to give it, and it will be sweet like honey. So if that's you, let's pray now. Jesus, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your care and guidance in our life. And I just pray that you would fill us with your supernatural wisdom, that for those who feel they really need it in a particular situation, that you would give it and they would know it and know um, you speaking into their lives in this real way. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our worship now, this is the time where we'll give our offering, so our offering baskets are going to come around now. Yeah, Father, thank you for the truth in those words that we've been singing, that your love never fails and never gives up. Thank you for your love. And we worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'd like to take your seats, thank you so much to the band for leading us in worship. Amazing. So some notices uh, this morning. Next Friday is a very exciting day. If you're a male in the room, we have men's mini golf. Now, I am shambolic, comically bad at golf. The last time I played at Bunkers, actually, I got a hole in one. I think it's the only Fools and Horses course. Oh, well done, Nick. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So that's next Friday. Uh, booking did close officially for that on Friday. If this somehow is like the first time maybe you're seeing this slide, um, I'm really desperate to come. Um, I'm sure we can make availability still. Come grab me or Russo there or anyone who looks like a really good golfer. I'm sure <laughs> can fit you in as well. That's so nice not fun. you then? <laughs> yeah, not me. Yeah, go to Russo. <laughs> and girls, we haven't left you out. We've got a ladies' night coming up on May the 17th. We're going to have some nibbles, coffee, cake, a chance to get together as ladies, hang out, spend some time together. But also at this night, we're going to be talking about our members-only weekend away for the ladies, and that's really exciting. That's coming up in November. So please do come along to this night to hear all the information, all the ins and outs, and maybe start putting some money aside uh, so when we come to the night, we're ready to book. So please do come to that. And then on the 19th of May, we have our baptisms. 
If you haven't been baptized yet, we'd love to encourage you to be baptized. There's a baptism class on April the 28th with Adam and Matthew. Um, So if you're interested in getting baptized, you can come to that class and hear a little bit more about the details and what goes on. Uh, So if you don't know Adam and Matthew, then you can come find me and Nath at the end and we'll point you out, we'll point them out. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, and you don't have to be good at golf to get baptised, is the other, the other thing there. <laughs> Sorry, that stuck in my head. Um, and then we have uh, our offering tab as well online that you can still do if that's your way of giving. And also uh, details uh, on there about our food share. Great. So the next thing, very excitingly in the room, is a kid spot from Christy. Uh, Morning, boys and girls. Morning, grown-ups. Morning, everyone online. Lovely to see you all today. For this Kids Box game, um, I've actually asked some of your parents to send in descriptions about you. And your job is, as I read some of these descriptions, and as the photos come up on the screen, is to think, hmm, can I tell which of my friends this is talking about? Does that sound okay? If you think you know who the description's about, then shout it out to us. Okay. Now, my first one, if I could have the slide up, is someone in 7 to 11s who is football loving. He is football mad. Now, I realize this could be about a few of you. My second description is his dad says he can eat for Britain. He's a bottomless food pit. (gasps) Someone's got it. And my third description for him, and I didn't know this, is that he's Welsh speaking. And it is indeed Theo. Well done for those of you that got it. Okay, let's try another one. My my next person is very strong. She likes organizing things. She's funny and she's very smiley. And well done on the left. It is indeed Bethan. Very good. Let's try another one. Okay, my next person really likes cars. Now, we can't see much in this photo, just a little bit of brown, curly hair. Have a think, kids. Have you got any friends with brown, curly hair? He likes cars. He loves to laugh. He's also a football lover. Any ideas? It is. It is Joshua. Very good. We'll try another one at the end, maybe. Very good. I loved hearing the descriptions that some of your parents were sending through, guys. And I wonder, kids, how are you at describing people? How are you at describing your best friend? Could you describe your brother or sister? When Jesus was alive, some people that were around were trying to describe him. But they didn't know him very well. And they said, well, hmm, maybe he's like Moses. Maybe he's Elijah. And one day, Jesus asked his best friend. And he said, how would you describe me? How do you, who do you think I am? And his best friend answered straight away. Peter said, well, you're the son of God. And it can be hard, can't it, to describe people when you don't know them very well. But Jesus' friends were with him every single day, and they knew him really well. They knew what he was like, and they knew that he was the son of God. And for you guys' kids, maybe you feel like, oh, I feel like I know Jesus really well. Or maybe you think, oh, I don't know if I know him that well. But we can get to know Jesus, just like his friends did, by uh, reading stories about him in the Bible, or listening to your parents as they read you stories about him in the Bible, and talking to him and listening to him, and you can get to know him and what he's like and who he is, just like his friends did. So should we pray? And I've got one more person for a little Guess Who game on the screen. Let's pray. If you'd like to close your eyes, that'd be great. Dear God, thank you that you know each of us really well, and thank you that we can get to know you. Help us to find out more about you, Jesus, and understand what you're like. Amen. Okay, should we try one more? Now, I have saved the trickiest one to last because this person isn't actually big enough yet to be in threes to sixes or seven to elevens. So, see if you can guess who it is. This person likes sleeping. This person is absolutely adorable. And she's very smiley. Should we guess who she is? Baby Tilly. Well done. Well done, Rachel Leach. Fab, thank you very much. Well done, Christy. Very cute photo. Well done, Tilly. 
Great. Well, now's the time in the meeting where our kids will go up to their Sunday school activities. If you're new here this morning, then Tammy will meet you in the foyer with a consent form to fill out before you go to Sunday school. So first up is our 7s to 11s. So if you're um, 7, 8, 9, 10 or 11 up to year 6 primary, then you can head out now. And with 7s to 11s, I should add, is Jason and Owl Ha. That may help to know who you're going out with. All our Sunday school workers are trained. They have some fun activities planned. So you're going to have a great time. On our threes to sixes is Rachel and Sandra. So if you want to head out with Rachel or Sandra. And then on our creche, so that's anyone under two, if you have a baby and would like to head out now to our creche, that's with Tim and Hannah. And you can go out now and follow them out. And there's a nice sofa, some toys for the kids. They can watch the talk on the screen. Get to meet Tilly, the celebrity. Get now. to meet Tilly, yeah. yeah. I was wondering if Christy was going to do a rogue version of uh, describing exactly. you or something. He's not very good at golf. <laughs> <laughs> Questionable shit. <laughs> I'm joking. He's not very good at shit. No, but great. Great to lead yeah. the meetings. <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> great. Well. She's our senior leader. She's got blonde hair. <laughs> She's very fun, <laughs> authentic, godly woman. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for all the kids to go out. <laughs> Can you guess? Any guesses? <laughs> no? Someone take a guess. <laughs> go on, Nathan. Just... Clearly, weren't accurate descriptions. Uh, it's Sarah hey. coming to speak with us this morning. Give it on for Sarah. It's such a tease. <laughs> so many children and babies, isn't it? It takes so long for them all to go out. So good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone online as well. So <clears throat> it's a different, little bit of a different type message today. Um, some months ago, I was praying about the church, and I felt God say something about us as a church community and I'm kind of going to get to what that word is through a few stories, okay? So I'm going to introduce you to some people in my life who influenced me um, as a young girl and a young woman. So let's have a look at a few of these uh, people and why they influenced. So the first is um, Jan and Marlene Blondiel. And these are some pictures of where we went out to visit them in Cambodia a few years ago. Yes, Jan did give me a ride on his motorbike, only up and down the street, but that was quite fun. Now, Jan and Marlene, when we first met them, we were maybe in our um, early to mid-30s pioneering Cornerstone Church. And they were pioneering a church in Belgium in a place called Kanoka Heist. And that's where um, it's a very wealthy area. There's lots of film stars and people who live there. And um, there isn't really much in the way of church. And so they were pioneering church in Belgium. And Jan, he ran a business where he sold like high-end wooden flooring. And sometimes he would take me along to these amazing European um, furniture shows where it was all really futuristic and I used to love all that and Marlene was a teacher in the local school and so Julian and I would regularly jump in the car go across in the Eura tunnel and go across and support them and help them in their church plant I remember freezing cold we uh, walks by the sea um, because over there they've all got the proper jackets and everything but we never did remember that freezing cold walks and then sitting in outdoor cafes in that freezing weather drinking Belgian beer or a nice coffee. And then um, we met all their pioneering team, really enthusiastic, interesting people. And of course, I remember, especially on the trips where Julian went on his own, I was at home with the children, he would come back with Belgian chocolates, the authentic thing, really nice. Now, with Anna Marlene, their first meetings, they would meet in this cultural center um, in Kanoka Heist, which was a very interesting place with interesting exhibitions that you would have to walk through on your way to the church meeting. That was interesting. Then they took over a converted warehouse and they started meeting and then you would arrive and there's all like high round tables and there was a bar where you could have a glass of wine or a beer or coffee because of course we're mainland Europe here and so you go over and have a chat. It's all very sociable and then they would have a meeting and we would often preach with an interpreter and it was a really amazing experience. But the thing that struck me the most with this couple is we became deep friends with Jan and Marlene. 
And we would sit up at night talking when they went to our, they came to our house, we went to their house, we'd sit up late at night talking about the world and church and Jesus and faith. But the thing I watched the most was their family dynamics. I was in a stage of life of like junior age children, and I would watch them with their teenage children. And I watched the family dynamics of how they were for each other, and they were like a team together. And I would watch this, and at one time, the five of them came to live with us um, for about 10 days in our house where we pioneered the church, 856, which was a big old Victorian house, so plenty of room for us five and their five. And all living together, I noticed how they raised their children. And I, I talked to Marlene, and I would say to her, you know, what are your secrets, Marlene? What can I learn from you? What do you do? What, what helps you? And I would just ask her. And what happened, because their faith was new, their two daughters found faith as well, but their son, Tim, kind of rejected this new faith. He didn't like it, and so he left home and went to live in Cambodia. And I watched them handle those dynamics of the pain of their son moving so far away um, because he didn't like the church planting or anything. He went as far as he could, but how they loved him, they respected him, they kept in touch with him. And now, Jan and Marlene are actually in Cambodia, pioneering church, because they kept that relationship with their son. They didn't let their different point of view cause them to fall out or have a rift. And so I was watching how they negotiated all these relationships. And it had a big influence on my life. It was so attractive to me how their family worked, although it's very different to our family. And it gave me a vision, hanging out with this family, gave me a vision of what life could be like in the future when we raise teenagers. How could we stay in love and in relationship with our teenage children as they grew up and found their own way and found their independence? How would we be able to negotiate that? I liked the fact that although they disagreed on things, there was no slamming of doors and swearing and marching off and you know, no dramatics and disrespect, but they were a unit and there was mutual respect and there was fun and they were for each other. So that's my first influencing uh, experience of a type of family. Okay, number two. This is a second kind of family type thing, but not a family like mum and dad and children. So here in this picture is Roger and Maggie Ellis. When we were at the Pioneer Conference in early March, we hooked up again with them. So there's Julian with Roger and me with Maggie. And in the back row there of Pioneer, there was a couple of rows of all of us who'd been in Pioneer for like the full many <laughs> 34 years or something. Okay, so in the early days of us pioneering the church, so when we were in like our late 20s and early 30s, we would go along to the Pioneer conferences, and Pioneer was launched by Gerald Coates and a team. And we would like sit in the congregation and watch them. And what really struck, struck me was not what happened in the meeting, but what happened after the meeting. And after the meeting, you would see Gerald and his team all up on the platform. Gerald would call his team together, and they would have a feedback of what worked. And when I found out after, because I asked one of the team, Gerald would talk about things that didn't work, they wouldn't do again, or things that worked, but they should have pressed more into it, things he was happy with. There's this kind of honest feedback. But I also watched them up there laughing and talking and in deep friendship. There was Noel Richards, Roger and Maggie, Sue Rinaldi, Linda Harding. Do you remember all these people, some of you, and Gerald and others up there? And I watched this mutual feedback and support, how committed they were to church working well across the nation, and how committed they were to each other as a team, that with all their strength and, and vision and communication skills, they would try their very best to help all the church leaders who were there to go and lead church effectively in the nation. I watched them. I watched these deep, accountable friendships, the mutual support, the laughing. And we became really good friends with Roger. And there was a time when Gerald retired and Billy uh, was the interim leader of Pioneer, that Roger and, and me and Julian and a few others, we actually led the movement for a little while in that interim period. So we got to hang out with Roger quite a lot. And it's a deep friendship. And it's great to uh, reunite again recently. So when we were in early ministry, I watched this, and I wanted it for us. I would watch it, and I would say to myself, we're just a young church plant, 
But can we be like what I can see in this team, in the after the meeting thing, to work in team with joy, with creativity, with fresh ideas, with love for each other, and with humor and kindness, and with accountability and honest feedback. And, and I learned from that team, it wasn't like it's perfect, like you don't make mistakes. And in our team, it wouldn't be like we don't make mistakes or, or mess up sometimes or be clumsy with one another sometimes. But could we do this? And it gave me a vision for what working together as a church ministry might look like and how that would then flow down into the church as a model of family, a kind of team and family working together. And do you remember when all those years we'd run the GLS? This was the only photo I could find. This is a GLS 2013 at Penlan. And all those years that we ran the GLS, we were like a ministry team family, weren't we, putting on those events. And then more recently in the June New and Cymru Conference, when we host leaders from all over the nation, we're like that kind of ministry team family together. And so that is my second kind of family picture of a team working together. Look how young we all look in this picture, 2013. Okay, the next one is this. This is the other people I want to introduce you to. Now, these people I knew from around the age of 16 years of age to 23. So my teenage years and early 20s. <clears throat> and these were three ladies in my home church in a large village called Selsey on the south coast of England. Very nice place where the sun shines every day, almost. And these three ladies, they were retired, they were pensioners, and they were three widows. And in the church, they had become nicknamed the three wise monkeys. You probably, some of you younger ones know that from your emojis, the monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. It's uh, the three wise monkeys. Anyway, you can look that up. You look blank. But that's where it comes from. Those little emojis like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. That's where it comes from. So the three wise monkeys, they were called that because they were always up to some kind of mischief. And they were called Ruth, Beatty, and Jenny. And they were funny. They loved Jesus. They had a big influence on my life. And I can remember at that time as a young teenager going to Brighton to these big worship meetings and they would have John Wimber and other people and churches from all over the South Coast would come together for these worship meetings. And they, they were just awesome. And I was just a young teenager and I would go along and what would happen, this, it would just be like amazing worship and I would look over and there'd be Ruth in the aisle with her tambourine. So this widow, a pensioner, would be dancing in the aisle, just dancing to Jesus with her tambourine. And then you'd see um, uh, Beatty and Jenny over here worshipping and praising God, dancing in the aisles. They were such an attractive, like, family of three, of these three older ladies. They had a deep, supportive friendship to one another and deeply faithful and supportive to the local church. They were like pillars in the local church. They, they weren't leaders. They didn't have like a, a title, but they were supportive pillars of that church. Reliable, enthusiastic, caring. And they were women of the Holy Spirit. They knew how to worship in the Spirit and how to pray. And we would go along to like these prayer meetings. I remember we'd go to some, this person's house and we would all sit on the floor because there's too many people for chairs. We'd all sit on the floor and we'd just be praying, waiting on Jesus. And these three, they would have prophetic words. They would be singing the Spirit. They were just, they were, they knew how to worship in the Spirit, but also how to live it out. So they had the spiritual gifts, but they lived out this care and kindness and love to one another uh, in a practical way. I remember when I was studying for my A-levels, I lived in a quite a noisy house with two brothers, and my parents were really busy. There's a lot of people in and out of the house. And Ruth said, well, I've got a spare bedroom in my bungalow. I'll set it up for you. You can come there anytime, gave me a key, and it was within walking distance of my parents' house, so I could just walk around to Ruth's house, open the door, go in. There's like two twin beds. I had all my revision and markers all over the bed, a little desk by a window. She set up like a little tea and coffee corner for me. So it was practical as well as spiritual. They really showed me care. I remember when Julian and I got married, and on the eve of our wedding, our honeymoon fell through. 
And Julian turned up at the door. His family had come down to Salzy, where I was with my parents. And uh, bad news, you know, the, the honeymoon's fallen through, but we can book something else. But it's a three-day gap in between. And so as soon as Beatty heard that, she moved out of her bungalow and um, put some food in it and let us go and live in her bungalow for the three days that we needed, just, just like that, just between the wedding and going to the airport. And they had this practical care. And I loved these women. And in Titus 2, it says, older women teach the younger. And they really taught me by their example. I don't think we ever sat down and did a Bible study together, but it was their life that influenced me. And in that part in Titus, it says for, for women to pass on their wisdom to the younger. I mean, it also says don't drink too much wine and don't gossip, which is also good advice. That doesn't set a very good example to our younger people. And these three women, they taught me about loving Jesus, about worship, about abandonment, about not being self-conscious of what other people think, but just to worship because Jesus is worthy of our worship, about not being self-conscious but finding freedom, and they were a foundational influence in my life as a teenager. And their faithful walk to God, they've all passed away, they're all in heaven now, but they were fun-loving, supportive of the church from beginning to end. Their faith did not waver. And watching them, it gave me a picture for the kind of relationships I want, how I'd like to influence those younger than me, and how I want to worship Jesus in my life. And um, one of these ladies now is the famous Ruth of the Tenby Watch story, in which you've probably heard Julian tell many times. But would you like to hear it again? Okay, so Julian and I were young, going out together, maybe even going out together for a year. And uh, I, I, my watch had stopped working, and Ruth, kind as she was, had lent me her watch. And so she lent me a watch um, because I didn't have one. And this watch, uh, this isn't actually this watch, this is a different watch. But this watch was one that her husband had gave her, and it was very meaningful to her. So I was wearing her watch. So Julian and I went to Tenby for the day. I took the watch off and put it in a pocket to make sure it's safe, because I didn't want to lose it or get sand in it. So we went down Tenby. I want you to imagine sunny day, you know, that big round thing in the sky that comes out sometimes in Wales. It was, the sun was out. We had a picnic. We're young. We're in love. We're walking along the beach. We're running up and down the sand dunes. This is a picture. These are the bits Julian doesn't tell you. And so it was all like, oh, holding hands. And so we set up our little picnic and sunbathe. And now, if you're a family, you sit on the beach and you make sandcastles. But if you're young and in love, you run through the sand dunes with the wind in your hair. And if you've ever been down to Tembe, you know those sand dunes, they go on for miles, don't they? Okay, so end of the day, it's getting a bit cool, family's going home, we pack up the picnic, we go back up to the car where it's parked, you know, up, up, all by those hotels and the railings. We went up there, and I put my hand in my pocket to find the watch, no watch. And I realize that somehow it's fallen out of my pocket in the sand dunes during our picnic. Oh, no. So we don't know each other very well at this time. I look at June and say, we have to go back. But I knew him well enough to see the, the look on his face was, this is impossible. This will never happen. We will never find the watch. But you're not going to give in, are you? <laughs> I could just see that in a moment's glance at him. And he's like, I don't think we're going to find it. We've been everywhere. And I was like, we have to go back. So we're walking back towards the beach. So Julian, not knowing me very well, or knowing me enough by this time, that I will stay there all night till it's too dark to find her watch. He was praying as we walked down to the beach. And he was praying, Lord Jesus, Lord, we have to find this watch. Show me where this watch is. And as he started to pray, God gave him a vision in his head of putting his hand in the sand, finding the watch, and it was going to be okay. So we go down to the beach, and we go down there, and we're like, well, we can't work out where we've been because it all looks the same. And so we're like, did we sit here? Did we sit there? We don't know where we were. So we start looking around. We don't know. Then we go to another part, and we go to another part. And in the end, we go to this part of the sand, and I'm looking around desperately for the watch. And Julian thinks, oh, yeah, God gave me this picture of putting my hand in. So he thrust his hand into the sand, closed his fist, opened his hand, and there was Ruth's watch. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? Now, the thing that that speaks to me, God cares about relationship. He cares about family relationship. And I don't just mean mum, dad, and child, but me and the three wise monkeys. He cares about that relationship. He cares about you. 
He cares about me. He cares about the details of our life. And that spoke to me so deeply. It might seem a small thing to some, but it was precious to Ruth. Anyway, enough said. I gave her the watch back. Never wore it again, just in case I lost it again. So this is the, this is the thing I'd like to, to bring to us today. Is that some time ago when I was praying for the church, I had a picture of us as a church community together, and I felt like God was like looking at us as a community with joy in his heart. And this was the phrase I felt him give me, the beauty of family. The beauty of family. When he looks at us, he sees this family of love that reflects the Father's heart of love. And he sees our community of love and he is joyful in the beauty of family. The beauty is beautiful to him. It is beautiful to God. And that through the beauty of family, it will draw other people in who are looking for Jesus, looking for answers in life, looking to belong to something. It is the beauty of family that will cause people to come in and to feel safe and to find the Jesus that we know. So let me unpack it a little bit. What, what do I mean? Well, first of all, I, I'm, I want us to understand, I mean, all types of family. That's why I gave the illustrations earlier. Jesus wants you to know that you are beautiful to him, and it is our connection. So when I'm talking about family, yes, I still mean, you know, a family unit. We've got families in the church here. We've got mum, dad, granddad, auntie, you know, children. There's a little family unit. It does mean that. But it also means clusters of friends, where friends have found each other. Maybe it's a cluster of two or three friends or half a dozen friends or eight or nine friends. Maybe groups of friends with family. Student families. Maybe you and your housemates have become like a family together. What about serving groups? Maybe could, the, could there be ministry families? Could the band be a ministry family? Could the sound team be a family? The conference team family, when we put on a conference, especially a small group family where we learn to belong together. And all these different types of groupings that make up the whole of our community. And God is saying to us, he has created beauty in family because it's about love. So we're going to look at just like two things here. So the first thing, really... It is all about love. And our love for each other is not perfect, but it's attractive and it's a signpost. And it is a signpost to Jesus. So when we love each other and we care for one another, it is a signpost to the Jesus of love. Because Jesus' love changes things. He changes us. He changes those around us. Jesus' loves, love brings security so that we are secure um, with one another and in ourselves. And a family unit, whatever that family looks like, is a unit of shared love and values. And it is attractive. So this is hugely attractive to anyone who's going to walk into uh, an alpha or a church meeting or a barbecue or your small group picnic in the park or our wreath making or whatever it is. That love that we have for each other is very attractive. It's like a magnet. It is attractive, just like the three widows, Gerald's team, and the Blondeal family. Love is a magnet. And in the book of John, where John records there the last Passover before Jesus went to the cross, and, it, and he tells a picture of how Jesus removed his outer garments and knelt down with water and washed the disciples' feet. The role of a servant. He humbled himself. He showed this sacrificial love to his disciples and said, love each other like this. Copy my example. It is a sacrificial love. And in John 13, Jesus says this. So this is for us too. A new command I give you. This is a command. It's not an optional extra of the Christian life. It is a command. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When people see our love for each other in these little groupings, they will know that it's a love beyond our ability to love, but it comes from somewhere else, and it's a signpost to Jesus. Because love itself has a beauty. We're attracted to it, aren't we? 
You see, I, I think one of the reasons Anton Deck are so popular, who just celebrated their very last Saturday Night Takeaway, and they've won the award of best presenters for like a million years, you can see their love for each other. They, they, in, they lead out of that love and enjoyment for each other. It's attractive, and that's what people see in us. So love in itself has a beauty, and we are made for love. And life is all about how we love one another. It's not really about our achievements and all those other things. They're all a bonus. But life is about how we treat each other and how we love one another. And as we do that, it has an invitational beauty to those around us. So they feel invited into that. And I feel like for us as a church, God is saying to us, there is an invitational beauty, the beauty of family here, that if we almost didn't do anything else, if we almost didn't put on any evangelistic mission, which, you know, we will still do all those things. But there's a, such a beauty within this. It's an invitational beauty that people want to come in and find Jesus just because of who we are in Jesus already in that love. And I remember some years ago, Clem prophesying, and he was stood here and he prophesied that people would come into the church broken and they would start at the back of the aisle. So this is like a picture. It doesn't mean this would happen in the meeting. It means us as a community. They would start at the back of the aisle broken. And as they walked towards, down the aisle towards the front, and when they got to the front, they were whole. And that talks about the love in community that helps bring wholeness, where people find wholeness in Jesus, but they find it in loving community. And as they walk from the back to the front, they are made whole by Jesus and the love of the community. And I think that prophecy is coming true and has come true. And the second reason why the beauty of family is so attractive is because we are wired for company. It's the way that we are wired. It's not good for man to be alone. And I love that scripture. There's an interesting scripture in Psalm 68 where the, the writer in the psalm, probably David, says, sing to God, his name is the Lord. Who is he? Who is God? He is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. God sets the lonely in families. This is talking about God as a father. He is a father to the fatherless. Do you feel fatherless? He wants to be your father. He is a defender of widows. Do you feel marginalized and need defense? God is for you. And he sets the lonely in families. And so those who are alone and on their own, he brings into the house of God. And those who don't know him yet, he wants to bring them into this family. And it's not a surprise because God himself obviously is three in one. Now, God could have chosen to just be one God, but he chose to be three in one. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. And the beauty of this is the beauty of family is right there at the core of the Trinity, who are working together, this relationship before function. And out of that beauty of family, I'm not surprised God is saying he looks at us as a community and sees his image reflected in us, that there is the beauty of family in us too. And this wonderful thing about the Trinity reveals the most fundamental thing about existence, that the core of everything is harmonious relationship. That is the very core. And that's why God desires to have relationship with us, just like he's in relationship together. He wants to bring us in to his family, that we become part of God's family. And so all our little family groups, we're a big family, we're part of God's family, and of course the family of God all over the world. So when we're made in his image, we are made to be in relationship. Now, I love this picture of these three little kids here. Don't kids just, like, make friends so easily? They're in the playground or you go on holiday and they all make friends. And there's something of that beauty of making friends quickly and how we are made to be in relationship and it's important for us to welcome people into our community and also to train our children to do it as well so that when guests go out to Sunday school or to youth or anything like that, even our children are welcoming and not just speaking to their own best friend. And so I feel God is saying to us, people will be attracted into the church family because of the beauty of love, because their desire is to be loved too. So let us continue walking in that beauty of family. Now, I can look at a few little practical things that we can do to embed this in our life. Okay, so well, one of the things I was going to mention, is, this is 
this is interesting, is, you know, the beautiful story of Ruth and Naomi and how, because there was a famine in Bethlehem, Naomi and her husband and the two boys go to Moab to live there, but tragedy strikes and Naomi's husband dies and her two sons die. So Naomi is left now with two daughters-in-law. Now, obviously, they're not actually related. They're related through the sons who have now died. So she says, look, you know, go back home. I'm going to go home to Bethlehem. And one of the daughter-in-law says, thanks. You know, I'm going to stay with my tribe. I'll find a husband here. But Ruth had seen something of God in, in um, Naomi. And they developed this relationship where she went back. So Ruth goes back as the foreigner so she was living in her own land. Naomi was a foreigner. Now they go back to Bethlehem where Ruth is the outsider. She's a foreigner. She doesn't have the same customs or the same ways that they do it in that community. Uh, Naomi goes back and you've got this mother-in-law, daughter, who form their own kind of family. And under um, Naomi's beautiful advice, harvest comes, Boaz is the kingsman redeemer, they fall in love, they get married, happy ending, read the story for yourself, it's only four chapters, beautiful, beautiful story. But what is wonderful is a different type of family. And what happens is Ruth goes from foreigner or stranger, grafted into the family. But not only that, when she and Boaz get married, they produce a little baby called Obed, and Obed becomes the grandfather of David. So Obed grows up to be a man, has a son called Jesse. Jesse grows up and has all those children, including David, King David, from where came the line of Jesus. So here is Ruth, found a family, found a, finds a sense of belonging, and is grafted into the lineage of Jesus. And I think that is just an amazing thing. And the name Obed means servant of God and worshiper. What a wonderful name. Isn't that lovely? And he becomes the grandfather of King David. But the thing that strikes me about the, fam the, the story the most is at the end when the neighbors get involved. And you can see these are very invested neighbors because the neighbors choose the name. And that's the sense of family, isn't it? That there's a little community together that you've got Boaz and Ruth and Naomi and the neighbors. And it says this in Ruth chapter 4, verse 16. Naomi, this is a grandmother now, Naomi took the boy. It's like, don't worry, I, I've, got, I've got this, I'll sort this out, grandma's got the baby. So Naomi took the baby, held him in her arms and cared for him. And this is like a restoration to Naomi. And the neighbors gave the boy his name, saying this boy was born for Naomi, the grandmother. They named him Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. And this is a picture in the Bible, a beautiful picture of family with all these different people involved, strangers, foreigners, home, neighbors, all involved in this, love, sacrifice, and family. I love that story. So a few practical things. Number one, if this, if this is a word from God for us, which I believe it is, it's talking about who we are, our identity as a group here together. Number one, what we can do, have a vision for it yourself. Have a vision. Take it on board. Let that seed settle in you and let it grow within you. That when God gives us a word, it will, it will return back to him active. It won't return back to him void. So take it into your heart and let this seed grow in your heart and ask yourself every day, what could the beauty of family look like for me in my relationships and who I relate to? And secondly, the second one is to grow to include new family. And as the church grows, we need to extend to grow with it. That we're not all in our own separate little groups. And new people come in and they can't infiltrate. There's nowhere it becomes lonely and on the edge. But rather, we're able to embrace. Now, Karis, as everyone knows, has these really cute little chicks. And she is Farmer Karis. And when she first had the little chicks, and we all could see them on Instagram, they were so cute and tiny and sweet and lovely, weren't they? But then, like all little things, they grew into fully-fledged hens. Not quite as cute, but Karis loves them. So there they are, in the middle there, they've grown up into proper hens. And then there's a little bit of, there's some new hens come in. I love these names. Can you see this? Tandoori, uh, ch tandoori chicken, chicken tikka. So anyway, so, so she's got these, the, the new chickens come in. But the problem is, 
There was chaos in the hen house. There was drama in the back garden because the old hens started to bully the new ones and they wouldn't integrate them into the hen family in the back garden in Llangevelech there. But no, there was a distinct pecking order. And so even the hens wouldn't allow the new members to come in and create family. And uh, Caris assures me that it's, it's, it's changing now. It's a little bit harmonious. There's still a bit of a pecking order. So that's where that comes from. But this is a vision for us. Extend beyond our own tribe. Extend beyond our own group. Draw them into your orbit that people aren't left on the margins. But we don't have drama in the hen house. But we're able to accommodate and assimilate and befriend new people. Number three, if you're new here, join a team. If you're not in a team yet, join a team. There's many, many teams that we have in the church. And if you're part of a team, you get to know other people. You get to know people you wouldn't otherwise have met if you're on a team. So make a start and start serving and join a family serving team, hospitality, maintenance, cleaning, production, stay and play, and be active in pursuing friendship. Don't just like, like we all sit at home and go, nobody's my friend. We pick up the phone and we invite someone for coffee and we are active in making friends with people. And number four, to know that there is beauty in your family, in your family. Now, I've got a picture here of little garden tools, and this is what it looks like in Nathan Christie's house, all the gardening tools. Now, this is the thing. If you're a gardener and you use your gardening tools, after a while, they look a bit beaten up like this, but they still do the job, don't they? And the thing is, we are not perfect, and we can focus on the imperfections in our own family or our family grouping, and we can think, oh, I don't think, oh, I don't think I'm beautiful to God. My gardening tools are beautiful to me because I love getting them out and starting gardening. I'm not very good at gardening, but I have a little try. It's not about perfection because Jesus knows we are not per perfect. He died for us knowing we're not perfect. He draws us into his family. He says, let me work with you. Let me help you. Let me mold you. I am the potter and you are the clay and I will mold you and strengthen you, as Nathan was telling us earlier. And so let's understand this is really important. You are beautiful to God and beautiful to others. And we all know our flaws and our failings and we've got to stop focusing on those imperfections because God knows us. He's not waiting for us to be perfect and to improve. And God sees his image in your family, and it has an inherent beauty that is attractive to him. I remember some years ago when we did the GLS, there was a speaker, Marcus, Marcus Buckingham, and he taught about investing in your strengths instead of spending all your time trying to sort your weaknesses. And I think somewhere in our education system, Sometimes we have to work on the things we're not very good at and go home and do extra homework. But now we are grown adults. We don't have to do what the teacher says, do we? We, we embrace life now and know, well, I'm good at this and I'm good at this and I'm rubbish at that and I'm not so good at that. So I'm going to focus on my strengths. I'm going to build on those strengths and bless those around me with my strengths. And the things that I'm rubbish at, I don't even have to do those anymore. I'm going to focus on my strengths. And it's called strength-based development. And so let me encourage all of us Focus on developing what you're good at. Let's not compare ourselves to others, but build on what you're good at, not what someone else is good at, and celebrate your unique beauty. Now, when we were away on the ladies' weekend, and I brought some of this message then when we all went away, I had a picture in the worship, and I had a picture of like an old-fashioned high street. And in that old-fashioned high street, you've got the grocer, the butcher, the florist, the ironmonger, the craft shop, the newsagent. You know, you've got all those uh, in a row. Here we've got, like, you know, the grocer and the newsagent. All these shops, one isn't better than another. They're just different, different content, different purpose, different shops. That's like you and me. We're all different people in the high street. One of us is a grocer, one's a butcher, one's a newsagent, one's a craft shop. And there's no competition they're all different content, different shops, all make up the high street, all of the same value. We are of the same value to God. So he put your unique gifts and talents within you. Give those back to him and let him use you in them and develop them, be strong in them and stop spending our time worrying and being upset about the things we're not very good at or our flaws or our failings. So let's stop concentrating on the flaws and failings and celebrate what we have together. I think we live a much more joyful, courageous life 
and focusing on our weaknesses. And yes, we are developing our character. There are things in our life that we are being shaped into the image of Jesus more and more each day. It's not that we don't stop doing that, but we don't focus on our, our weaknesses so much. And just a little word here. I felt as well, God, to say just to remind us that people are more important than things. People. This life, it's all about people. It's about one another. It's about those who don't know Jesus yet. It's all about people. Jesus came for people. It's interesting that Jesus didn't have a home filled with stuff. He traveled to be with the people. And so let's make sure we don't spend too much time pursuing things at the expense of relationship. We're so busy, I know, making money or pursuing things that it's at the expense of our relationship. And also the other thing I felt God say, it's not what we have that matters, but who we are. Shining out his love to other people. It's not about what we have. It's not about stuff, but it's about who we are. And then lastly, what if we could have a broader vision with this? So God has brought us this beautiful word that we have a beauty of family in our individual groups, our families. Can we embrace that? Can we live with it? Can we grow it? But the other thing is this. Supposing this is not just for us as Cornerstone, but how can what we build here affect church in the nation so that more and more people come to Jesus? What if every church in Wales and across the UK, what if every church across Wales radiates the beauty of family? That in every town and village and city, as people walk into church community, they go, whoa, you can feel the love, you can feel the friendship. This is amazing. So that people outside the church family can find Jesus by the love of the church. And what if walking in this prophetic revelation of the beauty of family can actually change church and change church in the nation and have an influence? What if the, there's a broader purpose than just us? And that if every apostolic church in our nation became models of this, models of the beauty of family that others would see and copy. So what if there's a broader purpose to this? And that when we host the June conference, that between us all we model. that When people come in, they see the hospitality team all serving each other and helping. They see problem solving quickly. They feel the atmosphere in here. What if what we do has a broader purpose than just us? And that every church just like us can be doing that in their community, that we bring change. So in June, get on team. Let's do this for a broader purpose. So let's um, close this session now. So let's think about the beauty of family, how Jesus sees you. You are beautiful to him. You are beautiful to him. He died for us. He didn't wait for us to smarten up. He died for us. You are beautiful to him. Make time for friendships. Find meaningful, deep, sincere relationships. Don't go through this life lonely. Value every size and shape of family that doesn't look like your size and shape of family. And to love one another and to love outside of our own tribe. Speak well of each other and foster love. Now, I've asked the band to come up because we're going to close to the song. I want to share this prophetic picture. So God gave me this picture of a huge pizza oven. So imagine, you know, if you go to an Italian restaurant and they've got a real pizza oven. It's a huge oven. I mean, it's huge. And inside it were just lots of people walking around. It was that big. I mean, it was massive, like the O2 Arena, a huge pizza oven. And I was like, Lord, what is that? And I felt God say, it's the simple things. It's bringing people into my warmth. Bring them into the warmth. And so we have a warmth here, like a big like pizza oven. I'm not going to cook people or roast them. But it's like people coming in. It's the simple things. How warm can we be? How much can we show our love in every setting that they discover Jesus in us? It is the simple things that we let our love show and we bring everybody in. Shall we pray?
Lord Jesus, we thank you for speaking to us. We thank you to know that you are so happy when you see us and you look at our church community and you say, I look and I see the beauty of family that reflects your image. And Lord, we see it in one another. And we ask that you'll help us today to, to see it and to live in it, to know that we are loved by you, we are beautiful to you. And mostly, Lord, help us to invite others into the warmth of it, that they may find you. We thank you, Lord, for all the change you've brought in our life, how you've brought security and peace, how when we try and make sense of this troubled world, that you are in us, and Lord, you, you guide us and help us and strengthen us every day. I ask, Lord, you'll bless every friendship group here, every pocket of family and friends and housemates and work teams, every part, Lord, every little pocket of family and the whole family too. But Lord, I thank you that it is your love that brings us together. And we ask, Lord, that you'll soak us in that love now. Thank you, Jesus. Come, Lord, with your love so we can feel it and know it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the band are going to lead us that lovely song we led earlier. Let's sing it as a response song about how much Jesus loves us. Let's sing our love back to him, but let it go deep in our hearts to foster our love for one another. So let's stand together, and the band will lead us in this last song. i
Father, I thank you for your awesome love. Thank you that when you look at us, you see beauty. You love us. And help us, Lord, to, to show that love to other people, to our family, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, band. Thanks, Sarah, as well. That was outstanding, I thought, this morning. It was really, really brilliant. Um, Should we give her a clap? Yeah. That was an excellent message. Well done. And as we finish today, we would love to pray for anyone who um, needs healing. If you're in physical pain, we see a lot of healing here at this church. Uh, so there'll be a little team at the end over here to pray, especially anyone who um, might be struggling with like pain in the left side of your neck or anyone who's struggling with like tonsillitis or regular like throat infections. Um, I used to struggle with tonsillitis all the time as a kid, like nearly every month I was on antibiotics. And um, I always had a little, you're probably not supposed to do this, all the doctors would tell me off. I had a box of antibiotics in my drawer as like a backup because I had it so much. And someone once had a word of knowledge. They said, someone here suffers with tonsillitis a lot and you've got antibiotics as a backup. Go home and throw them away because you're going to be healed. And um, so I thought, oh, that's me. So I went home, I threw them away and I've never had tonsillitis since. Uh, but when I was collecting my PhD um, healing stories, there was someone else who wrote the exact same story who was in that conference and also had the same story. So, um, yeah, if anyone has stroke conditions as well, we'd love to pray for that. So if you're watching online and you're in pain, let's pray for you now. Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that our physical bodies are important to you. And we just speak your healing power into our bodies right now. Anyone suffering with like throat infections or pain in the left uh, shoulder and neck or any conditions, Lord, we speak your healing power. We say condition and pain be gone in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And please do come to the side if you would like prayer. We'd love to pray for you. But thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you for watching online and have a lovely Sunday.